All right. Seems like we got a good amount of people now, so um, we'll get started here. So thank you all for joining us today for our webinar. Today, we're going to discuss the ins and outs of GCC high migration and what specific challenges you could expect to face, along with how experts can help you overcome them. Today, we're joined by our partners over at Liftoff. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about our host organizations. Awesome. So first, we have Liftoff. Let me end this poll over here. Awesome. OK. First, we have Liftoff. Liftoff is a technology company focused on Microsoft 365 cloud licensing and consulting. Over the last 12 years, Liftoff has worked with over a thousand organizations on licensing and migration planning to the Microsoft to the Microsoft Modern Workplace platform. Liftoff was the first partner enrolled in the Microsoft AOSG licensing channel, which specifically can sell GCC and GCC high licensing to government and government contracting organizations. If you'd like to learn more, you could visit the link on this slide. Now let's talk about RSI security. RSI Security is a premier managed IT security and compliance advisory service provider. We have professionals for all cybersecurity and compliance needs, from data privacy to PCI, healthcare data compliance, cyber defense, penetration testing, federal programs, and more. These are just some of the services we specialize in as a full suite cybersecurity solution provider. We work with some of the world's leading companies, institutions, and governments to ensure the safety of their information and their compliance with applicable regulations. Um, now I will introduce our panelists. All right. We'll start by introducing Ron. So over the years, Ron has worked with some of the leading technology companies in the world, including Microsoft, Oracle, and IBM. He's held roles in technical consulting, technical pre-sales, and partner mentoring and readiness. Ron worked for five years at Microsoft in the Business Solutions Division as a solution specialist. Prior to founding Liftoff, he served as a CTO at a government contractor where he led several IT e-learning projects for the Department of Homeland Security and Human Services. Ron holds a master's degree in technology education from Johns Hopkins University, and he has taught at the high school and college graduate level. Next, we have Chad. Chad is the technical operations manager here at RSI Security with over 20 years of information, um, 20 years of experience in information technology and telecommunications leadership in a variety of industries. He is passionate about leveraging technology and data to help drive operational efficiency and business profitability. He is PMI. CAPM and HDI SCM certified and will receive his Master of Information Systems in March 2023. So before I pass it off to Chad, I'd like to go over a few FAQs. First, any questions you have throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to use the Q&A button to submit all of your questions throughout. Also, you'll receive a copy of the presentation, a CPE certificate, and a recording via email tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. I will now pass it over to Chad to take it away. All right, thank you, Nico. And hello, everyone. Uh, we're gonna start our conversation uh, kind of reviewing the Microsoft Cloud Stack based off of the poll. It sounds like a lot of you are here to learn, learn about uh, things and just gather some more information. So. And I apologize in advance. I've been uh, losing my voice, but I'm going to work through it. So <clears throat> Microsoft GCC High is a version of Microsoft Office 365 that's specifically designed to meet the security and compliance requirements of organizations that work with sensitive data and require enhanced security measures. Um, you know, whether you need Microsoft GCC High or not, you know, a few questions to consider are going to be things like, do you work for an organization that's required to comply with certain regulations or industry standards such as HIPAA or NIST? Uh, do you handle sensitive data such as personal identified, viable information, financial information, or confidential business information? Do you require additional security features beyond what's offered by the standard Office 365, such as access controls, data encryption, and advanced threat protection? Or do you work in a high-risk industry or field such as the government, healthcare, or finance? So if you answered yes to any one of those questions, you're going to probably want to consider using Microsoft GCC High. 
ultimately, the decision is going to be specific um, and depend on the specific security and compliance needs of your organization. So it's recommended to consult either your IT department, your security team, or a trusted partner like RSI Security to determine the best option for your situation. Before embarking on a journey of a GCC high uh, migration, uh, some big deployment questions to ask are uh, listed on the screen there. That we can all agree that proper planning leads to a successful project. And with GCC high, um, it requires careful planning and execution to ensure a smooth transition and successful deployment. Um, some big questions to ask is gonna be like, what's the scope of your deployment? Uh, you're going to want to identify the users and applications that are going to be affected and determine your timeline and resources required for the migration. Uh, technical requirements, you're going to want to, I mean, GCC High has specific technical requirements such as network connectivity, domain configuration, and user authentication. So it's important that your existing infrastructure meets those requirements and make sure any necessary changes that are needed to your existing infrastructure happen before the actual migration. <clears throat> Uh, the data migration requirements, uh, what's the data migration strategy? It could be hybrid, big bang, or staged. We'll talk a little bit more about those different types later. And um, you're going to want to make sure that you have, uh, you move all of your existing data to the new environment. So it's going to involve things like migrating your email messages, files, and other data to the new platform to ensure that data is properly secured and protected during the migration. <clears throat> Um, managing user access and permissions, um, GCC High includes advanced controls um, and security features. Uh, so it's important that you define how you'll manage user access and permissions in the new environment. This may also involve setting up new groups and roles, defining policies for data access, sharing training users on the new security features, even incorporating and synchronizing yeah, your existing Active Directory. And then what are the testing and validation requirements? Um, before deploying Microsoft GCC High to your entire organization, it's important to test and validate the new environment to ensure that it meets the security and compliance requirements. Uh, this could involve testing applications and services, conducting penetration testing, and validating security controls and features of the new environment. So by addressing these you know, big deployment questions, we can help to ensure a successful migration to GCC High. Um, let's see, with regards to regulatory and compliance, there are compliance areas that are fulfilled by utilizing GCC High. Um, these uh, include US government compliance. So Microsoft GCC High meets the requirements for uh, frameworks such as the Department of Defense, the Federal Risk and Authorized Management Program, FedRAMP, and the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, ITAR. Uh, data protection. So Microsoft GCC High provides enhanced data protection and security controls, including advanced threat protection, data loss prevention, and encryption to ensure sensitive data is protected against unauthorized access. Uh, provides access controls, um, robust set of access controls to ensure that only authorized personnel can access your sensitive data, including multi-factor authentication, role-based access control, and network segmentation. Uh, Microsoft GC High provides compliance reporting and audit logs to help organizations meet regular, uh, regulatory requirements and demonstrate compliance to auditors. Uh, incident management is provided uh, as well as response capabilities to help organizations respond to security incidents and minimize the impact of a breach. And then security and compliance certifications. Uh, Microsoft GC High has obtained various uh, certifications uh, security and compliance certifications, including SOC 1, SOC 2, ISO 27001, and HIPAA uh, to demonstrate its commitment to security and compliance. It's also achieved the CSA, the Cloud Security Alliance STAR certification, which is widely recognized uh, third-party certification for cloud security. And then Microsoft GCI also provides continuous compliance monitoring and assessment to ensure that organizations are meeting their regulatory and compliance obligations. With regards to GCC High and compliance frameworks considerations, uh, there are a number of them. We're gonna highlight a few. 
uh, regarding the cybersecurity and maturity model certification for the CMMC. Um, then it can support compliance with requirements outlined in the various CMC's, uh, CMMC levels. But in order to determine the appropriate level of uh, CMMC compliance, uh, it's important that the organization conduct a thorough assessment of their data and infrastructure, as well as the specific requirements outlined in the framework. <clears throat> Once that's been identified, the organization can ensure that the environment has the necessary security controls and protections to meet those requirements. Uh, those include things like implementing access controls, configuring network segmentation, enabling data encryption, and implementing a robust incident response capabilities. Even once it's all said and done, the organization is going to want to ensure that they're able to provide the necessary evidence and documentation to support compliance with CMMC requirements. For the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, um, it's designed to meet specifically the security compliance requirements outlined in the NIST Special Publication 800-171, which is focused on protecting controlled unclassified information, or CUI. Organizations uh, should first verify that the GCI environment includes the necessary security controls and protections. These uh, include the access controls, data encryption, vulnerability management, and then some response capabilities. For the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program, or FedRAMP, um, this is a government-wide program that provides a standardized approach to security assessment, authorization, and continuous monitoring for cloud products and services. Uh, Microsoft GCI is FedRAMP authorized at the moderate impact level, which means that it's been assessed and approved by the government for use with sensitive but unclassified data. The International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR, is just a set of regulations that the government <laughs> Sorry, they govern the export and import of defense-related articles and services. Uh, GCC High includes a dedicated ITAR environment. It's designed to meet the specific compliance requirements for ITAR. And uh, organizations should verify that the environment includes the necessary security controls and protections, such as access controls, data encryption, audit logging, in order to protect the ITAR-related data. PCI DSS, or the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. Um, this is gonna be the set of security standards that applies to any organization that processes, stores, or transmits payment card data. So when evaluating uh, Microsoft GCI for this compliance, the uh, organization should ensure the environment is gonna include the security controls and protections such as access controls, encryption, and vulnerability management. For uh, HIPAA, <clears throat> this is a U.S. law that sets the national standards for protecting the privacy and security of personal health information. Organizations that handle this protected health information, or PHI, uh, must comply with these requirements outlined in the HIPAA privacy and security rules. Um, uh, HIPAA compliance and security controls that the Microsoft GC High environment uh, can help support include the, uh, in order to protect PT, uh, PHI, include access controls, encryptions, and audit logging. And then the general uh, data protection regulation, or GDPR, is a regulation of the European Union that governs the collection, use, and storage of personal data. Organizations that handle these personal data of EU citizens must comply with these requirements. Uh, GCI helps um, with these uh, security controls and protections through access controls, data encryption, and data minimization. So what's this all mean? If you decide to go with GCC High for a migration, what's uh, what's it look like as far as the, the timeline and, and logistical concerns? Uh, these all vary depending on the size and complexity of your organization's environment. So um, as a general timeline uh, rule and logistical concerns, the high level uh, items and milestones are gonna include a pre-migration assessment and planning where the stage typically takes a few weeks to a few months, depending on the complexity of the organization and involves assessing the current environment, identifying potential challenges and developing a migration plan. Next milestone would be data and application preparation. Uh, this can take several weeks or months, depending on the amount of data and applications that need to be prepared. But it involves backing up data, updating applications and resolving compatibility issues. 
configuration of the GCC high environment is one of the shortest milestones. It only takes a few days to a week, but it involves the setup of the GCC high account, configuring security settings and creating necessary users permissions. Once you have all that taken care of, the migration of data and applications happens. This stage takes several weeks or months, depending on the amount of data and applications to be migrated, but it involves transferring the data and applications to the GCC high environment using tools and techniques such as Azure Site Recovery Service or the uh, Databox service. Testing and validation then takes a few days to a week and involves testing the performance of the applications and the data that's accessible and secure and validating all the integrations and dependencies that are functioning properly. And then post-migration monitoring and maintenance involves ongoing monitoring of the GCC high environment to ensure ongoing security and compliance. Logistical concerns uh, to be aware of when migrating are the compliance and certification requirements. Uh, this is where it ensures that the organization meets the necessary compliance and certification requirements for migrating to GC High. Data classification is important to ensure that the data is properly classified and that the necessary security controls are in place. Network and connectivity requirements for accessing GC High need to be properly configured. The migration tools and techniques need to be identified, the appropriate tools and techniques are being utilized for migrating the data and the applications uh, to the GCI environment, ensuring that they're properly configured. And lastly, user training, ensuring that your users are properly trained on the use of GCI High and the necessary controls, security controls. Now take it away, Ron. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate that. And thanks, everyone, for uh, having me here. Um, we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about licensing now. And hopefully what you pulled from Chad's piece is these things are complicated. The projects take time and effort and planning um, and certainly execution. Um, the profiles you see on the screen here, I like to start with this when we talk licensing, because this is going to lead into what type of licenses are ultimately the right fit for you, okay? And I'm gonna start in the fourth column, tenant to tenant. What we have here are recipes, and each of you would fit into one of these five columns. I can't really think of a, of a, a sixth column. So everyone's gonna fit into one of these recipes. And when we talk tenant to tenant, what we're talking about is someone that's already in the Microsoft Cloud. Maybe you went, eight years ago before the GCC high was even available. Uh, and now you're ready to convert. You're going from a Microsoft tenant to another Microsoft tenant. Um, some people choose the wrong tenant. I can tell you that the, the biggest decision that you make, the first most important decision is, are you buying the right environment? Is the GCC high the right place for you? Right. You, you have to be sure of that. And if you're a government contractor and if you're concerned about CMMC and ITAR and CUI and all the things that Chad mentioned, the answer is almost certainly yes. But you want to be positive that that's right, because there is no easy way to jump from one Microsoft place to another. OK, now, license wise, when we have a tenant to tenant migration, the good news is, is you're probably familiar with 365. You're familiar with the products. And um, in many cases, you just want to take what you have in one place and bring it to the other. So when we're ready to, to talk licensing and quote and purchase and all of that, um, these tend to be very similar to what you would have in place today. Okay. Uh, the next one to the uh, in the middle here, hybrid, right? A hybrid, this means that you're running an on-prem exchange server today. And this is good too, because you understand Microsoft and understand exchange concepts. So there is some carryover when you move from an on-prem system to the cloud. So again, these tend to be customers that are willing to take on more right out of the gate because they understand some of the Microsoft systems. Um, so again, it could just be the, how much do you wanna buy a hybrid person, someone migrating from on-prem, they're likely to want uh, or be ready to get more. This, by, by the way, is the best way to migrate, uh, in our opinions. It's, it's very low disruption for the end users. You don't have to pay for extra migration tools. Um, and it just tends to be, um, uh, a nice, it's, it's a lot of work. It's more work to get there, but the, the execution and the, the user experience is excellent there. Um, and I'm going to keep going left to the Big Bang. 
right? If you don't raise your hand, if you're still using exchange 2007, right? Uh, but they're out there. Um, this big bang approach is good for old exchange or, or Google. We do see a lot of Google migrations as well. Um, and the big bang just means that the strategy is everyone's going to go live at once, all at once. You go through the planning and execution in weeks, possibly months, and then you're going to turn it on all at once. Um, it does require third-party tools. So as we talk about licensing costs, you should be thinking uh, there's going to be a cost to Microsoft for the licensing, of course, and there's also going to be a cost um, probably for third-party tools. We go to the first column here, non-exchange, right? We still see a lot of these as well. People still running POP and IMAP systems. Lotus, not so much anymore, but believe it or not, they're still out there uh, group-wise. So these tend to, sometimes we can't even um, use third-party tools. So sometimes it's elbow grease on those kinds of migrations. Again, it's just a recipe. Understanding what your source system is is a, the first question I ask anyone who wants to talk about because that's gonna put them in a column here and then we can talk about the recipe and what the appropriate licensing would be. Uh, the far right column to the rescue, this is the one you wanna avoid, don't, don't be here, right? This means you probably tried to deploy it yourself and got it a little too deep and now need to come and get some help. If you could avoid this, by all means, please do. It is, it's harder to untangle. It is, it's harder to untangle and then restart. So um, if, if you have expertise, that's great. I've seen people self-deploy, but I've also seen many that didn't get there. And then when they come to somebody like RSI, that now it's, it's a bigger challenge. So avoid the to the rescue. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Okay, when you buy GCC high licensing, there is one possible way to purchase it. With Microsoft, they typically give you 10 ways to buy their software. That's not the case with GCC high. Okay, and uh, my first bullet here, when you're less than 500 users, you have to purchase through a Microsoft program called AOSG. This program has been around for 10 plus years. They originally created it, Microsoft created it to sell licensing to government, government customers, cities and counties, things like that. Uh, when the GCC High was created about five years ago, they Microsoft decided to only make it available on AOSG for good reason. Um, one of the reasons is, is the license provider, Liftoff, we have no access, no visibility, we can't see if you're using this, the licensing. So that's an important piece, right? Compliance, uh, liability. Um, we can apply licenses to a tenant, but we, uh, we have no access, no visibility. <clears throat> if you're over 500 users, you actually have an option. You could buy AOSG or you could buy through a classic EA enterprise agreement. But that's it, the only ways to buy GCC high, okay? Um, AOSG, it is a one-year commitment, right? Which means you're gonna pay up front for the first 12 months. You're gonna own those licenses for 12 months. Each year at your renewal, it renews for another 12 months and that cycle repeats. So one year at a time, you do have this three-year agreement, but this is important. You're not committed for three years. You have a price lock for three years. Your commitment is one year at a time. What that means is, is if at the end of a year, you don't want to renew, you don't have to renew, okay? And that's different. Uh, EAs don't work like that. Other licensing channels don't work like that. So one-year commitments, three-year price lock. Now, what happens when you grow? When you hire people through the course of the year, add licenses any day of the year, they go through typically same day. So there's a process for adding those licenses that's very fast. Um, in general, GCC High, this program, this AOSG program, it is a fast program, okay? The orders go through, almost all orders are going through within a day or two. New customers, add-ons, sometimes less than a day. And that's awesome because for those of you that have been around for a while, these orders used to take a month. 
Every order, no matter what it was, took four weeks to fulfill. Those days are gone. Okay, Microsoft has cleaned up and they're for several years now they've they've been on top of this. So fast order processing. Last thing about the licensing program, it does include technical support. So when you buy GCC High, you have the ability to call or open web tickets directly with Microsoft. Okay, um, all channels don't include that. So that's a unique thing here. Uh, and it is GCC High support. The, these are dedicated GCC High employees inside with, within Microsoft. Um, and that matters. There's always going to be things that come up in a system, right? An exchange mailbox may need a, a, a support issue. So there's always things over the course of a year, you may have a couple of these that come up. So it's good to know that piece um, is included as well. Okay, let's uh, next slide. <clears throat> so when it's time to decide what it is to buy, if you're familiar with Office 365 already, well, pretty much the same things exist in the GCC High, with the exception of the business SKUs, okay? The business SKUs uh, do not uh, exist in the GCC High. Business Premium, Business Standard, Business Basic, they don't exist. So it's the enterprise SKUs. So I'm going to talk through what's what these are, but um, it's good to know that. The other thing, price. Pricing in the GCC High about 40% higher than commercial across the board. So when you're looking on the Microsoft website and you're looking at products and it is a commercial product price, you can pretty much put 40% on it and you're gonna be very close to what GCC High is, right? We get a price list from Microsoft every month and it is consistently right there. Okay, so when it's time to decide what you want to purchase, and let's say you don't understand a thing about GCC High or Microsoft products. The first thing you'll want to do is wrap your head around what we call the base products. All users get one base product. That may be all they get, but they have to get one base product. So on the screen here, there's two kinds of base products. There's an exchange product and there's an Office 365 product. Okay. We have customers that all they want to purchase is email. That's it. And you can do it. If you wanted to start first year, maybe do email only. Those are your first three line items there. Exchange kiosk, plan one, and plan two. Okay. Um, and just so you know, this, this information that we're covering here, this is all part of like an Excel sheet that we talk through and I share and we fill in this quantity column. So it is a workbook that we use that I've tried to make you know, presenter friendly here. So um, if you just want email, just buy email, okay? The next layer down are the Office 365 products, F3, E1, E3. There is an E5 as well on the next slide. Uh, the Office products, I will tell you that the last item here, Office E3, it's the most popular thing that we sell. Still, it has been for years. It is a great product to start with. It includes email, so it includes that third item, Exchange Online Plan 2, right? 100 gig mailboxes, email encryption, email archive. It includes installable Office. So you have the rights to install the latest and greatest full version of Office. And it includes what I call the collaboration bundle, OneDrive, Teams, SharePoint. Okay, it's a great package. There's a lot to deploy there, but it's a manageable chunk to understand and, uh, and begin with. So when you go to the E1, that uh, second from the bottom, the price drops drastically a third, you know, it's a third of the cost, but you've also just given up your installable office. So another one of those big questions is, is do you need installable office as a part of your licensing? If so, we have to make sure that you're getting the right thing. You can mix and match here, okay? So the other thing that you're going to do is you're going to take your users and put them into categories. Maybe you're a one-size-fits-all. Maybe every single person gets the exact same license. That's fine. Lots of customers do that. But maybe you're going to say, you know what? We have, a, we have somebody on the manufacturing floor, and then we have desk workers, and then we have an executive staff. So maybe we have three categories. So again, this is just part of the process 
you know, this takes time. This is, I'm not expecting anybody to hear this today and be an expert. This usually takes, I say about an hour to fully digest and understand the licensing, but know that it's, it's about that much, right? It's not more than that. With an hour of effort, you'll be um, fully aware of, of what this licensing is about. Okay, let's go to the next page. I have one more page of base products, okay? So there's 11 of these total in these two slides. On the first slide, we had email only. We had some office SKUs. This first one here is the Office E5. And then we have something called the Microsoft SKUs, M365. These are different. They're different products. I wish Microsoft could have called them something other than Microsoft because it would have been helpful uh, just in terms of, you know, um, understanding that there are different products. So we have Office 365, we have Microsoft 365. Now look at this, uh, the last item here. The last item here is Microsoft 365 E5, $93 per user per month. That's a lot. This is expensive stuff. However, that product at the bottom is loaded. I would say roughly a third of our customers, our government contracting customers, I'm basing this on hundreds of customers that we license, that's what they buy. That's a one size fit, that's a one product for every employee. So it is expensive, but it is loaded. I mean, when I say loaded, it's including everything from the office product. It's also including things like Intune, Azure Info Protection uh, for data labeling and classification. Azure Active Directory, it's including Windows Enterprise Upgrade Rights, it includes Power BI, it includes Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Office 365. Again, I don't expect you to understand what all these are, but just know that that is a popular product. Now, you have to decide, do you want that much? So uh, one other concept I, I like to talk about when it's time to buy licensing is, do you philosophically in your organization, do you want to buy big and buy early with something like this $93 product? Or do you want to start smaller knowing that you're going to grow and add and evolve, right? When you buy this big $93 version, you're going to have all the features, right? And it's just a matter of how fast can you roll them out to be compliant, but what we see are there is a, a, a good amount of contractors that say, look, I want to take the first step in this direction. I want to, I want to get into the GCC high. I don't want to overspend. I don't want to buy things before I'm ready for them. I know it's not going to make me compliant out of the gate, but I want to get on this maturity model. I want to evolve with it. So let's start smaller knowing that in that first year, you're probably going to add to it, okay? That's, again, that's just a decision that's, that's made based on your comfort, how fast you need to be there. Are the auditors coming uh, this year uh, or not? You know, those are the things that, um, uh, that help guide that conversation. So what I can tell you from the licensing side is I can help you with trends of what we see and what people purchase. And, um, and sometimes that helps, um, helps with the overall decision. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Ron, sorry, sorry to jump in here on this, on that last slide you were just presenting, we had a question come up. Uh, what does BYOT mean? Oh, great question. Yeah, so BYOT in the first item here is bring your own trunk. Okay, so for the, what that's, this is referring to the phone system, dial tone and audio conferencing capabilities. So in the GCC high, okay, most things work just like they do in the commercial Microsoft cloud. Phone and audio conferencing are not that way. So if you want to go to GCC high and you want things like audio conferencing and phone system, what I'm talking about is dial tone. Do you want to replace your desk phones? with a new black phone that you buy from Amazon for a hundred bucks and everybody gets a new phone and you want dial tones for incoming and outgoing and voicemail, right? We're talking legitimate phone system here. In the Microsoft commercial world, that stuff is pretty darn easy. In the GCC high world, it's not there yet. It's possible, but it's not there yet. 
So also this is about audio conferencing. So audio conferencing just means you could conduct a meeting just like we're doing today and people could call in to a phone number. It's a conference bridge, right? So that, those are features that I use it every single day. I use audio conferencing every single day. Um, in the GCC High, if you want that to work, there's a couple ways to make it work. You can do something, BYOT, which is bring your own trunk. Now you better have somebody that's a phone expert on your staff. They are going to have to buy a session border controller, hardware or software component, configure it, deal with the phone companies, and make it work that way. I will tell you very, very few go that route. The alternative way is you work with an, another company who comes in and plugs this up and makes it work very quickly. So there's a company called Call Tower. Audio Codes does it as well. CenturyLink does it as well. There are a couple telco consultant companies that really understand this piece. And what they can do is come in, you're going to pay them some money, you're going to pay them some ongoing uh, monthly fees, but they are going to make it work in the GCC high. And I'll tell you, before, last comment on this, the, the, the contractors that do this, that need it and want it, they're typically tenant to tenant migrations because they were using these features in the commercial side. Their users are used to those features and they have to keep you know, the continuity in the GCC high. Um, that's typically who is, who is um, deploying uh, with a BYOT and phone system. Good? Okay. So that was the base product. So once you figure out your base product, now you get to look at all of the add-on stuff that you can put on top of your base product. And pretty much everything that I'm talking about already is available as an a la carte item. Right, so look, the first item on the list here, Office 365 installable, right? You can buy it, it's a part of half of the bundles. Or let's say you started with one of those smaller bundles, you could add it, it's just an a la carte item, add it any day of the year. So now we've got a new dynamic, right? Do we want to buy a big bundle that has most of it or do I wanna buy a lesser bundle and start adding some add-ons to it? Okay, so something like Office Pro, that's very popular. The next one down, 30 cents per gig for extra storage. People always ask, well, what happens if I run out of SharePoint storage? Can I be sure you can buy more? Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of these other items on um, the next, on a couple slides. So let's go to the next slide. What I want you to take from this is there are probably I don't know, 70 or 80 add-ons. I'm just giving you a glimpse of what some of them are. Um, here you go, look at this one here, Power BI Project. Many of our customers are very involved with Project. I will tell you that Project Plan 3, that's the one that everyone buys. It includes installable project. So that, you know, when we talk, when someone says they're interested in Project, we talk about these and then they always buy Plan 3. Visio, likewise, at the bottom of this screen, there's a plan one and a plan two. Plan two includes installable Visio as well. That's what everybody buys, right? And uh, this middle section here, we've got, you know, the audio conferencing and phone system that we talked about. These things are available a la carte, right? Now look at this, audio conferencing is free. That's a new, that, this is a new, that just last year, Microsoft uh, made this free, which is awesome, right? The problem is, you now have to engage that call tower company, somebody else who can come in and plug it up and make it all work. Phone system there, again, if you want to replace your phone system, it's possible. You're still going to need something like call tower. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, last slide of add-ons. Again, I just want you to get a sense of, look, we've got Azure Active Directory. I'm going to talk about this in a minute info protection. So when you're dealing with data labeling and classification, right? I mean, this is directly tied to your compliance. This is something that Chad and his team, they want to roll up their sleeves and talk about protecting the data. How do we classify it? How do we label it? How do we protect it? Right? So there are these kinds of granular items that you can purchase. 
Again, this is included in a lot of the bundles. Um, Intune here, which is row 45. Um, Intune is about mobile device management. It does a lot of things. Intune can do a lot of things. But where we see it apply the most is people want Intune to protect iPhones and Droids. So you have iPhones and Droids. It has company data on it. You need to protect it and lock it down. Intune is Microsoft's answer for that. Um, you don't have to use Microsoft, but it's just a, if you want to keep things under one umbrella, that's, uh, that's how it could happen. Um, the bottom of this screen, Win E3, Win E5, these are the upgrade rights to Windows Enterprise. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's go to the next slide. So when we talk about licensing, I, I'll, I'll always try to pull out a few things that I don't want to say they're no brainers. I don't think that's necessarily the, the right thing, but these are so popular and common. Um, Microsoft has something called Defender for Office 365. There's a plan one and a plan two. Um, it's very popular. It's popular because it does something called sandboxing, right? Sandboxing, I'm sure that's somewhere in NIST 800 or CMMC. I'm not a compliance expert, but you know somebody on Chad and his team, they would tell you they could tie this back to why you need this. But what this does is it's going to take your incoming mail and it's going to examine it in more detail, okay? So it's safe attachments. What does that mean? It means that if somebody emails you an ex a, a zip file, right? With this tool, Microsoft will take that zip file, unzip it. If it's a Word file, they're going to open it. Excel files are going to open it. They're going to examine it for things like macros, VB scripts, um, any type of malicious links. It's a, it's a zero hour detection for malicious links and activity in your email. Normal filters don't do this, right? Barracuda has something that does similar to this. Uh, you know, most filters are just going to filter based on IP and that's what it is. This defender is zero hour detection. It also does something called safe links. And what that means is if somebody emails you a file, emails you a link, sorry. If they email you a link and say, hey, go check out this link, www.liftoffonline.com. That link doesn't go to that place. It's actually gonna redirect it to Microsoft. Microsoft's gonna check it and you're gonna get that big red screen you see on this, on this slide here, right? So it, it, is, it is checking your URLs for malicious behavior as well. So again, sandboxing is what we talk about for this particular one. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Just a couple more guys, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A here. Um, I, I, I have to talk about this because this is probably the most talked about, most important, best security thing that you can get in the Microsoft cloud. Uh, nearly 100% of our customers buy this. And the ones that it probably aren't understanding it yet, but I would tell you it is high 90s into who buys this. So there's a couple, there's an Azure Active Directory Premium Plan 1, Azure Active Directory Premium Plan 2. It's, I don't like the name of it. I don't think it has much to do with Azure or Active Directory. Um, it is premium, I guess. Uh, what they should call this is buy this and you'll get awesome security features that let everybody sleep better. That would be a, a better name. So what does it do? What does this Azure Active Directory Premium License do? The first thing it does is geo-blocking, okay? Geo-fencing, and uh, I, everybody wants that. So with this license, you can create a policy that says, nobody can sign in from our system from outside of the US, period. Oh, except for Barbara, who's vacationing in Switzerland this week, we'll make an exception for her, right? So exception's fine, but it is a geo-fence for signing in. And that in and of itself is, Super important for the contractors out there. Okay, what else does it do? It does something called risky sign-in management. Okay, so I'll give you an example. I have a, uh, I had a customer in Florida and they had a user who they said was never leaving the state. He was just, wasn't, he didn't travel. And all of a sudden he was signing in from Iowa. And a minute later he signed in from Florida. And a minute later he signed in from Iowa. 
Well, that's called impossible travel. There's actually a name for it. It's called impossible travel. That is a sign-in event that shut down that account. Now, of course, he was fished. He gave up his password. And this tool reacts to it, shuts it down, and look at my second bullet, alerts the IT staff right away. So now you know what happened. You can go address it. Uh, it's a proactive email alert system there. Okay, that's pretty important. So I like that. I don't. You could probably live without it, but it's still great stuff. Third thing I, that that this uh, premium license does is it allows you to create conditional access rules. So here's a good rule. A good rule is if my employee is in the office. And we know because of their IP address, if the employee is in the office, we're not going to bother them with MFA. The likelihood that somebody stole their computer and broke into the office to connect, so unlikely. So what do you do? A lot of people say when we're in a known location, that could be the office, that could be their home office, right? We're not going to bother them with MFA. But if they're not, as soon as they're in Starbucks or traveling or hotel, whatever, Yes, we're going to hit them with MFA, multi-factor authentication. Okay. The other thing that uh, there are other benefits to this Azure Premium. Um, there one other worth mentioning is it will allow you to roll out additional multi-factor options. So most are rolling out an authenticator app on the phone, and that's you can do that. With this, now we open up more multi-factor options call my desk phone, send me a text message, right? You're not forced into just a, an authenticator app on the phone. So again, uh, highly recommended, very popular. And, you know, I know that Chad and the RSI team, you know, they're deploying these things for a good reason to connect the dots between your compliance, okay? All right, um, next slide. Yeah, so that's it. I'm happy to answer questions. I know Chad's still on the line and Nico. So I think we're going to go to the uh, Q&A. Do you want to see what questions have come in? Yeah, so it looks like we got uh, the first one here. Is there any impact level three? If so, does it fall under GCC high? Chad, I think that's one for you. I don't think I can answer that. Although I will say there's, actually I will take it. Um, within, so when you wanna understand the GCC high, I personally think that the best source is to get the answer directly from Microsoft. And there are some blogs. Uh, there's a gentleman named Richard Wakeman, who's a Microsoft employee, who has put out the best series of blogs you'll ever read on this topic. And he's going to talk about impact level three. So uh, if you, if even if you just do a Google search for Richard Wakeman, GCC High, I can guarantee you you're going to find his blogs. He cross links them. There are about ten of them, and there's a particular blog that talks about the history of the GCC High, and that's the one that's going to um, talk about that impact level three. Uh, the next question, the difference between GCC and GCC high. Good. I'm glad somebody asked that. Um, GCC was built 10 years ago. GCC high was built five years ago. The GCC, Government Community Cloud, was built specifically for government customers, right? We license hundreds of cities and counties for the GCC. And those are there it, 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 particularly because they need government compliance. So for example, police departments, sheriff's departments, they deal with criminal justice information, right? So if you're a government entity, you want GCC uh, because that's where Microsoft addresses the, that set of compliance. If you're a government contractor, you almost certainly want GCC high because that's the one that's addressing CMMC, NIST, CUI, ITAR, all the things that Chad talked about. Now, here's what makes it weird. Microsoft will let you buy either one, right? As a government contract, actually any three, 
Mike, as a government contractor, you could buy commercial 365, GCC, or GCC high. The trick here is you need to make sure you're buying the right one because like I said, tenant to tenants are not simple projects. You're a full migration to go from uh, one to the other, okay? Uh, next question, uh, is GCC high only for organizations looking for DOD? Um, that's a good question. Um, no. So my, so the answer is no. So Microsoft will allow a government contractor to go to the GCC high. And in order to get into the GCC high, you do have to be approved. Okay. So it's not just DOD contractors. Um, with a cage code or a SAM registration, you can get into the GCC high. You're allowed to. So what that means is that could be a consulting partner, like uh, you know, as a licensing partner or RSI, we could be a part of the GCC high. It also means um, that auditors, right? We, we do see license orders from uh, the 3PO's, the third party auditors that are out there. So, um, but that's it, right? The only people who want to be in the GCC high really have a reason for it. They're either auditing, they're consulting partners, or the vast majority are in fact the, uh, the actual contractors. Okay, hopefully that answered. Um, ah, from an MSP perspective, can GCC, GCC or GCC high customers be managed in Microsoft 365 along with our other customers? So from an MSP perspective, no. Right. This is different. AOSG is different than CSP. So again, I'm 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 assuming that question about the MSP perspective. You're an MSP. You're probably used to purchasing CSP licensing, which is fine. So first of all, you cannot buy GCC High on MSP, CSP. Right. It's not available. It has to go through AOSG. So that's the first thing. If you're an MSP, you're a managed service provider, you've got a bunch of government contracts, right? Contractors you're working with, you do not get a console like you get with CSP to manage all of your customers. Um, each one is individually done. And I think that's for good reason, right? Um, the goal here is the reseller, the license provider, Liftoff, and the MSP, neither of us have visibility into that environment. We can't see the users. We don't know their email, even know if they're using the licenses. And I think that's by design here because for compliance and liability, I don't think we should. Okay. Whereas if you sell to pizza shops and not for profits, the MSPs have a different experience where you do get that kind of visibility. Okay. Uh, Satya BYOT, I see we answered that one, hopefully. Um, Ah, okay. There's an interesting one. Can we use a third-party gateway, Okta, instead of Azure Premium? So what I, I, I'll answer, we have a lot of licensed customers that use Okta. We have a lot that use Duo, right? So you're using Okta or Duo, Duo for your identity management. I can tell you that we see a lot of it. I can't answer the question of, does it make you compliant? I would think it does, but that would be, you know, that compliance question would be for uh, RSI. Okay. Um, this next one, GCC high build monthly. No, uh, I wish it, it, it's not. So with, uh, this is Rich, GCC high is 12 months up front. Your initial purchase, you pay for the 12 months up front. Um, and Anything you add is prorated. So you will pay for the remaining months on add-on orders. But as soon as your anniversary rolls around, new 12-month cycle, you pay for the next 12 months. So this is not like CSP licensing and other channels or direct portal where you can just go month to month. This is not a month to month. 12 months up front, prorated add-ons, okay? Um, oh boy, can I run multi-tenant? 
a multi-tenant session border controller in Azure Code Tenant and serve multiple. Mm. So that's a great question. Um, I would say, oh, I would not going to answer that. Uh, yeah. If I know that it's possible to host a session border controller and serve multiple customers out of that SBC, right? So that's something that's possible. I don't under, you know, I can't speak to the licensing of it or the compliance of it um, or the business case for it. Uh, I can just tell you that people looking for teams and audio conferencing, there is an easy path and there is a challenging path is what we've seen. I've, had, I've seen a couple of customers spend months trying to configure BYOT and SBCs and eventually throw their hands up. I have seen a couple do it successfully. So I'm not saying it's not, you know, if, if you've got that expertise and SBCs and Azure and um, PowerShell, it's a lot of PowerShell to do that, then I, I would say, yeah, that could be possible. All right, the next question. Okay, Ooh. Uh, does my data center from where I am providing the PSTN SIP trunking need to go through compliance or does it only limit it to Azure my data center? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I don't know about that one. That would probably be something you'd have to ask uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. RSI or Chad, do you have a, any thoughts on that one? I I personally do not, but I know members of our team would be able to answer that question. So, okay, I'm happy happy to circle back with uh, the individual to provide an answer offline by email. Perfect. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and Chad, that next one might be for you too as well. Do critical infrastructure require GCC? I mean, it's compliance, right? I mean, because yeah. critical infrastructure, sure, you know, it depends on how you define critical infrastructure, but, uh, you know, and I would say GCC high there just to split hairs, right? Um, if it's a government contractor, almost everyone goes to GCC high, not GCC. Um, in terms of compliance for equipment, what are the security framework compliances covered? Well, that, um, Chad, I know you had your slide about what, what compliance is addressed here. I don't know if you have more to add to that. The, uh, what was the question? Apologies. The second from the bottom, um, equipment, servers, and devices, what are the security framework compliances covered? Um, let's see here. I mean, I'm just not sure where it's going, right? I mean, it's yeah. CFD and NIST 800, 171, and ITAR. I mean, it depends on what. Um, I mean, it depends on yeah how it's being used and the, the individual use case, which is which is why, with regards to the uh, overall strategy, you would want to do the, the pre migration assessment and planning session in order to be able to answer all of those questions to be able to get started with yeah, the uh, migration project. All right. Yeah, I think we're coming up on time there, Nico. Were there any other questions? I think we're good. Oh, uh, okay. One more question. Uh, will those devices be automatic, automatically be compliant? I would say no to that. Nothing is automatically compliant just by being in the GCC high. Keep in mind what you're buying is a framework and a data center that helps you be compliant, right? The Microsoft employees walking these data centers have been through fingerprint check, background check, work history check, right? Uh, the Microsoft has structure in place to help you be compliant, but ultimately you need someone like RSI to configure this thing to the specifications. Most of these features, the vast majority of the features I'm talking about are not enabled by default, right? So these are things that have to be configured and addressed and uh, enabled before anything is compliant. Yeah, that, that's agreed. So GCC High gives you the, the, the ability to become compliant. 
but there is a lot of additional um, work in order to be ensured is done on the, the, the back end uh, on an ongoing basis. So uh, ensuring that your, your security controls, even though they're um, Im implemented once, uh, remain implemented and that they remain up to date. Awesome. So it seems like um, that was the last question. So I just wanted to uh, thank Ron and um, the team over at Liftoff so much for joining us today. And thank you, Chad, and everyone that joined us in the audience. Uh, we'll be in touch tomorrow via email with the recording of the presentation, the slides, and your CPE certificate. Um, so I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, all.